first time in 20 years I felt really good. And it has to be illegal. It might be Barney Miller's most remembered episode, and one of the first sitcom segments to depict drugs as something other than a criminal element. But it didn't come off without a fight or a price. This is the story of Hash, and how it changed the now classic sitcom forever and for the better, thanks to the dogged determination of its stubborn co-creator, who nearly gave his life for his show. Let's open the shoebox and sample the brownies, because we're gonna hash out Hash, next on Best X. Producer Danny Arnold fought so much with his network ABC over Barney Miller that it gave him a heart attack. Okay, that might be overstating it, but maybe not by much. In 1976, Arnold spent the previous two years fighting with ABC over the content of his sitcom Barney Miller. ABC president Fred Silverman loved the show. His network standards and practices department did not. It was the time of the dreaded family viewing hour a kid-friendly block between 8 and 9 that the networks collectively imposed upon themselves with the blessing of the FCC. CBS, NBC, and ABC were attempting to stave off any more letters of protest from concerned parents and parent groups over the rise of sexy and violent content in that hour. It was, of course, a ridiculous policy, thinking that at 8.30 the programming should be okay for young people, but that at 9 p.m. their parents should simply make them leave the room. Regardless, from January 1975 to mid-1976, Barney Miller was stuck in that family hour time slot. Arnold begged the network to move his show to 9 p.m., but Silverman wouldn't budge, and that led to frequent clashes between Arnold and ABC's vice president of standards and practices, Alfred Schneider, whose catchphrase was essentially, we can't put that on the air at 8.30. Schneider would regularly come down to the Miller set with a marked-up script, demanding Arnold remove all the hells and dams and cruds from the dialogue. It got so bad at one point, Arnold and Schneider almost came to blows over the censoring. The fights were constant, the rewrites were endless, and the on-set hours were insufferable. Filming episodes took so long that Arnold abandoned the idea of a live studio audience in favor of a laugh track. It got so bad that Arnold found he had to change his tack or lose his sanity. As he testified during the Family Hour trials in May 75, you can't fight City Hall and win every week. Now, there's a great book by Jeffrey Cowan called See No Evil about the fight for the family viewing hour and Danny Arnold's hilarious court testimony. I'll leave a link down in the description. But then during the 1976-77 season, three things happened that eventually led to one of the funniest episodes in TV history. The first was that What's Happening wasn't pulling in the numbers ABC thought it could. The second was that a federal judge ruled the family viewing hour unconstitutional. And the third was that the Barney Miller writers pitched Danny Arnold a story in which the cops at the old 1-2 got stoned out of their trees. Trying to keep everybody in a good mood. I don't know cops make that kind of money. We're very good cops. I fell in a sewer. Ah, yes. Gotta have a sense of humor in a job like this. <laughs> In 1976, drugs, of course, were frequent plot devices in primetime, but they were seldom, if ever, played for straight-up comedy. Drugs on TV were usually connected with a crime. Have you been smoking marijuana? Marijuana is illegal, I know that. That's right. For now. In a couple of years, things may change when all the kids grow up and start wearing ties and going to the polls. Marijuana is going to be like liquor, packaged and taxed and sold right off the shelf. Any drug references in comedies were few and far between. All right, I'll grant you point one. He is planting. But what's he planting? This time of year, barley, lima beans, maybe. And or? And or what? And marijuana or some other illegal crop. Come <laughs> come with us, Granny? I can't. I'm going down to the lake to smoke some crawdads. <laughs> smoke some what? Crawdads. But first, I need a little pot. <laughs> You know, that remark makes just about as much sense as the ridiculous marijuana law, which I am against because it is too severe. Arthur, the punishment does not fit the crime. It's terrible to think of all the kids using artificial stimulants like marijuana to solve all their problems. Uh, this could use a little more vodka. 
how, how can I calm down when the police are in there getting high over my salad? <laughs> They're gonna take me to jail. We gotta, we gotta go out there and stop them. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute, now how can they take you to jail if they're eating up all the evidence? <laughs> That's food for thought. <laughs> but in none of these shows were any of the characters ever seen comically stoned. This was a year and a half before Cheech and Chong's seminal Up in Smoke. So what Barney Miller was attempting to do kinda hadn't been done before. Danny Arnold knew it, but he hadn't shied away from taboo-busting stories in the past. Homosexuality, prostitution, even suicide, were all on the table when it came to the show's comedic stylings. In the summer of 76, between the show's second and third seasons, there was a talent change in the Miller writer's room. Arnold famously had a love-hate relationship with his writers, and the turnover in staff was kinda legendary in TV circles. As the show geared up for season three, Arnold hired screenwriter and notorious hypochondriac Roland Kibbe as a writer-producer. If that name sounds familiar to movie buffs, it's because Kibbe was one of those who was outed as a communist during the Hollywood Red Scare of the 1950s. Kibbe had also worked with Norman Lear and Danny Arnold writing on the Tennessee Ernie Ford show 20 years earlier. Anyway, as the writers sat around the table pitching ideas for season three, Kibbe tossed out the idea that maybe everyone should just get stoned. Arnold liked the idea enough to hand it over to rookie freelance writer Tom Reeder, whose first draft of it he called The Gift, in which Wojo, Max Gale, comes into the precinct with brownies made by his girlfriend, ones he doesn't know are laced with marijuana. As Reeder recalled on Ken Levine's terrific blog Hollywood and Levine, the outline had a B story about a guy who turned himself in after being AWOL from the Marines. On the next pass, that element went away, and the title was changed to Pot. Then, Reader says, fellow rookie writer Riney Weege, who later created Night Court, suggested they change marijuana to hashish. Why? Because, as Reader writes, its effects come on more quickly, which helped move the story along. Reader adds that he took Weege's word for it. After a few rewrites from the writer's room, especially by Weege, whom Reader credits with adding loads of good jokes, Arnold loved the script, but sighed when he thought of the fight he might have to have with the network. Again, he asked them to move Barney to 9 p.m. to make Hash the first episode in that new time slot. As he told the Associated Press later, quote, There's nothing particularly controversial about Hash. We've done shows far more controversial than this. I just thought it was a very funny show, and it's good to start the new time period with it. ABC agreed. Yeah, kind of. They slotted the episode on their schedule for Thursday, December 16, 1976, at 8.30. They sent out a press release describing the storyline, hash brownies and all, though curiously many listings called it mash, not hash, while other listings called them cookies, not brownies. Anyway, ABC even made the episode available for newspaper reviewers. Perhaps executives were trying to gauge if there would be any backlash from those family groups after the episode was announced. When the reviews came back glowing with nary a protest, ABC changed course. At the very last minute, too late for the newspapers to change their listings, ABC canceled the December 16th airing of Hash, slotting it instead two weeks later on Thursday, December 30th at 9 p.m., right after the floundering What's Happening. Call it Danny Arnold's Christmas Miracle. I'm Hal Linden, hoping you'll join the joyous holiday spirit with all of us on Barney Miller. Hash is a wonderfully loopy episode with hilarious performances, especially by Abe Vigoda as Fish who would depart the show only a month later for his own spin-off, and by Jack Sue, whose deadpan deliveries and terrible coffee made him a fan favorite. His rendition of It's Almost Like Being in Love at the end of Act One proved to be the episode's standout moment. But it didn't come as a surprise to those who knew that Sue had been a Broadway singer in his younger days, with some even calling him the Chinese Bing Crosby. See, Sue was born Suzuki, but changed his name after World War II in order to avoid any lingering prejudice against Japanese Americans. After a two-year internment at Camp Topaz, he embarked on a nightclub career as a singer. One night in 1948, he helped the club's stand-up comedian change a flat tire, and that comic was Danny Arnold. 
According to Reader, the song Sue sings from the musical Brigadoon popped into his head as he was writing it because he, Reader, had been in a production of the musical while in high school. You never know where inspiration is going to come from, he admitted later. Now, everyone in the cast in this episode gets to play drunk for the big laughs. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody see my legs? Get these things, have them analyzed. Fast, Nick. Not that way! And Lyndon was not happy about it. Lyndon took the script to Danny Arnold, complaining that everyone in the story had a standout moment except him. According to the excellent book, Barney Miller and the Files of the Old One Two by Otto Bruno, Lyndon told Arnold, Hey, everyone's got their great dramatic scene, and here I don't have one. And Danny gave me a quick lesson in comedy right there. He said, I have to have somebody to compare them to. And I said, of course, that's my function. And that one response from Arnold also changed the nature of Lyndon's approach to Barney going forward. Said Lyndon, quote, I was the anchor that you could compare the odd behavior to. That's what made it odd, that there was somebody being solid and doing his job all the time. And I came to terms with that very quickly. In one line, Danny gave me the whole concept of what my function was in that comedy and how comedy works. Arguably, after this episode, Lyndon's comfort with his straight man role elevated the character to one of TV's best anchors, serving as a template for other great ensemble anchors to come, such as Alex on Taxi, Sam on Cheers, even Andy on WKRP. As for Tom Reader, he told the Ian Talks Comedy Podcast that Danny Arnold tried to take full credit for the episode himself as he did with all the Barney Miller episodes. Thankfully, this move was rejected by the Writers Guild when the script was sent in for credit arbitration, and today, Tom Reader is credited as the sole writer. Directed by the show's in-house director, former actor Noam Pitlick, Hash aired December 30th, 1976, and did everything ABC hoped it would do. It landed Barney Miller tied for 11th in the Nielsen ratings and elevated what's happening to number 14. But perhaps more importantly, it firmly affixed Barney Miller at 9 p.m., though Danny Arnold suspected the new time slot wouldn't change his combative relationship with ABC. I'm inclined to believe I'm going to have the same trouble that I've always had, he said. Maybe I can win battles a little more easily than in the past when we were on earlier, but I don't think the problems will ever stop. As long as there's a department whose job it is to censor, they're going to look for something to censor. In the end, he was right. Arnold suffered a heart attack in 1979 on the set of Barney Miller, leading him to have bypass surgery and to scale back his day-to-day -day operations on the series, which eventually won the Emmy for Best Comedy in 1982. As for Hash, it's today considered a critical and cultural classic, landing at number 77 on TV Guide's 97 list of the best episodes on TV, and currently sporting a 9.3 out of 10 from users on IMDb. For me, however, the lasting legacy of Hash is a line I repeat every time I eat brownies. Let's all say it together. <laughs> Thanks for watching Best Apps. Be sure to like and subscribe for more behind the scenes stories of television's most famous and infamous episodes.